Hey, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian, just letting you guys know if you enjoy the content here on the channel and want to support the channel, click on the Patreon link in the description below. As I'm not allowed to monetize the channel here on YouTube, I depend on you guys to keep this channel going and growing by becoming patrons of the channel and sponsoring at the Patreon page. There's great rewards for doing so in tiers as low as 2 to $5 per month. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. Hell Cop and Highway to Hell. Hey, I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening to the 80s slasher librarian. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. I've also played BTK, Ed Gein. Let's just say I've murdered a lot of people. In fact, I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. So just keep that in mind. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Just cause you play it cool Don't think you got this fool tonight All right Don't ask me to stay Friday the 13th, Part 4, The Final Chapter, a fan novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 2. Nurse Morgan didn't hear the door to the inventory room slowly swing open and the slow, laborious breathing, steady at first and then growing with intensity. She swept up the last few pieces of broken glass into the plastic biohazard bag, shaking her head miserably. What a night, she thought sourly. What a hell of a night. She knew what she was doing the minute she got home, get a hot shower, take some sleeping pills, and hit the sack. She could still feel Axel's hands all over her. He was a total pig. Why did she keep falling for him? He was inconsiderate. He was rude. He was crude. He was everything that girls hated in a guy. But yet, she still found herself sneaking down to the morgue every now and then to see him. And that wasn't even the worst of it. He'd get inside your mind. Now, she was dropping things everywhere and being a total klutz. What a sleaze. Her thoughts were interrupted by footsteps behind her. Get lost, Axel. I'm busy, she yelled over her shoulder, not bothering to turn around. I've had more than enough of you for one night. The footsteps kept coming closer and closer. The breathing grew louder. A huge shadow fell over her. Nurse Morgan felt her face growing hot with anger. Read my lips. Leave me alone, she shrieked and spun around. A hockey mask was staring right back at her. Before she could react, Jason Voorhees' powerful hand clamped around her neck and slammed her back against the wall. She let out a blood-curdling shriek as Jason lifted her into the air, her feet dangling in mid-air, his grimy hand in a vice-like grip around her throat. She reached out, clawing and scratching at her assailant, seeing the utter hatred in his eyes through the two holes in the blood-stained hockey mask. It was him, the guy who killed all the kids at Crystal Lake, and he was killing her. She barely had time to process the realization. All she could do was continue to scream hysterically at the top of her lungs and try with every ounce of her strength to pry the maniac's hands from her throat. It was all in vain. There was a suddenly a flash of silver and a scalpel was plunged into her midsection. She let out a guttural gurgling noise, blood bubbling up in her throat, and her vision faded to red and then to black. All she could hear next was the sound of her own flesh ripping as the scalpel sliced down through her torso. For a split second, she felt the most agonizing pain she had ever felt, and then everything went dark. Her limp body collapsed in a pool of blood and entrails, and Jason let the scalpel fall from his hand. He felt the seething rage inside of him slowly subside, but it would soon come back. It always did. Whenever he killed, he felt the rage dissipate, and an unbelievable sensation of satisfaction washed over him. But it was only a matter of minutes before he felt it again. 
Whenever he saw young people doing filthy things to each other, it brought the feeling back, each time stronger than the last. He had heard them on the gurney in front of him, climbing all over each other, kissing, moaning with passion, and all he could feel was an overwhelming lust to eradicate them both, to watch their blood flow between his fingers, to feel a blade slice into their flesh, to watch all of the life drain from their worthless bodies. They were all the same, just like the blonde girl, the one who took his mother's life. He felt the same insatiable fury when he had killed all of them. He didn't feel the bloody gash above his left eye where she had struck him with the axe. He hardly felt anything when it happened. All he felt was the anger and hatred towards her, towards them, towards all the young careless people who ran around and did filthy obscene things to each other in the dark. The ones who weren't watching him, the ones who had killed the only one who loved him, drove her crazy mad with grief and then killed her right in front of him. For twenty long years, he survived lost in the woods, unable to find his mother feeding off the wilderness, and then, after what seemed like forever to his unhinged mind, he watched from the shadows of the trees as his mother was killed on the shore of the lake, watched her head be sliced clean from her body and roll off into the water. He didn't understand. He couldn't understand. All he could understand was that they hurt him, and hurt his mother. They let him die. Nobody had cared. He remembered twenty long years ago as if it had happened yesterday, a vivid fragment of blurred and distant memories. His whole life had been a blur, trapped in his silent world, living on his own out in the woods of Crystal Lake. But now, he saw what the world was like and he despised it. They hadn't been watching him, they only cared about pleasuring themselves, like his mother had always said. He remembered his mother had brought him to the edge of a field where the counselors had been hanging out one night and told him how the youth were all engaged in drugs and making love and how disgusting it was and that they would all pay for their sins. And she was right. Every time he saw them out here, every time he saw young people at Camp Crystal Lake, they were all acting the same, just like his mother had said. Getting nude and running into the woods to touch each other and pleasure each other, heedless of any worries or cares, they all had to pay. Wherever they went, they spread obscenities in their disgusting ways. Time and time again, he would spy on the counselors back at Camp Crystal Lake, and just as his mother had said, they would all be engaging in drugs and making love like feral animals, like the disgusting, abhorrent, worthless pieces of flesh that his mother had told him that they were. He remembered how all the kids had ostracized him, ostracized him until he was walking out alone by the lake while the other kids were playing soccer, and had fallen in, and no one had heard him scream. The counselors hadn't heard him scream. No one had heard his screams. The rage grew. He had woken up, not remembering how long he had been underwater. The only thing that had helped him survive was the thought of his mother. He remembered floating with the current until after what seemed like forever, and then he found himself somewhere on the lake shore, far away from his mother and from Camp Crystal Lake. He had survived for weeks that turned into months and years, hiding out in some abandoned cabins and surviving off canned foods and berries and any fish or small rodents he could catch. After what seemed like eternity of rote survival in the wilderness, after nights of dreaming of his mother, he had gotten back to Camp Crystal Lake, but found his mother gone, and the cabins vacated and condemned by the authorities. There he stayed, hiding out in the cabins and running into the woods whenever a Crystal Lake deputy would come to make his rounds and make sure no one was trespassing on the campgrounds. And it was there that he had seen them, counselors and Steve Christie disturbing his home, turning it back into a place where teenagers, young people, happy, normal people, the ones who fit in, could go to make love and ruin his safe and peaceful hideout he had had for himself. He had run into the woods, terrified of them, still feral and out of his mind, but one night he heard his mother calling for him. Kill her, Mommy! Kill her! Kill her! He had heard her cry. He was watching from the shadows as the young, pretty blonde woman had fought his crazed mother on the shore of the lake and decapitated her. The rage grew. She hadn't forgotten about him. His animalistic mind had thought she had been screaming his name, killing for him and seeking vengeance. And now the only rational position in his mind was to finish the job for her. To kill Alice and anyone who came back to his woods, to his lake. 
He managed to take his mother's head before the police started crawling all over the camp and built a crude shack in the woods with some spare supplies he had stolen, where he lay in wait, dormant, not bathing or grooming, growing even more into some kind of uncivilized animal, surviving in the woods, waiting until the time was right. Jason would hear his mother's voice calling to him as he would kneel down to her by her decomposing severed head in the back of that dilapidated shack. Kill her, Jason. Kill them all. Kill them all. Do you know what they did to me? What they did to you? They weren't watching you, Jason. They're very bad. They do very bad things with each other. Very bad, selfish, disgusting things. You must kill them. They can't hurt you. Kill for me, Jason. How could Jason let his mother's killer live knowing she had only been loving him so much and avenging him? He couldn't let her live. She had to die. He didn't remember tracking her down. He didn't remember climbing into her apartment through an open window with his mother's severed head. But he remembered her scream as she saw the head sitting on the top shelf of the refrigerator where he had placed it on display as a morbid reminder of what she had done. Her death happened in a wild blur. He had stopped her screams with one hand and held her as she struggled in his grasp like a fish on a hook. And then he had plunged the ice pick deep into her skull and into her brain. He didn't remember plunging it in, but he could remember the satisfaction from hearing her dying screams, and that he had to kill again and again. They all had to die, every last one of them. The counselors, selfish, careless teenagers, and all young people, they were all responsible. They would come back again and again to fulfill their selfish and abhorrent desires in his woods. It was what his mother wanted, and now he had to finish what she started. Jason was going back to Crystal Lake. Welcome to Crystal Lake. It was morning in Crystal Lake. The golden rays of the sun had just begun to peek over and paint the tops of the tall pine trees that surrounded the lake. An old weathered dock stuck out into the middle of the water next to a rickety sign that read Crystal Point. A beaver poked his head out of the water, scanning the surroundings for any sign of incoming danger, and then dashed back underneath the surface, seeing the two blonde women jogging down the trail near the lake shore. Seventeen-year-old Trish Jarvis used to hate the idea of living out in the middle of nowhere. She had begged her mom not to whisk her away to a town out in the country, out to Crystal Lake, and take her away from her school. But it was no use. She was firmly set on the idea. She had also hated the idea of being homeschooled, but that was her mother's idea as well. It's much safer than public school, her mother would say. You won't have any bad influences like the kids in public school. Over the last few years, she had gotten used to the peace and quiet of the country, so she didn't complain much about it. After all, she could wake up in the morning to the sounds of birds chirping in the trees, instead of brakes screeching and cars honking and pedestrians hollering for a taxi. And since they moved out to the country and her mother began homeschooling them, she did have so much more time to spend with her family. They were able to go on an early morning or even a late night jog around the lake without worrying about getting mugged. It was almost a picturesque scene. The shimmering lake could be seen through the tall trees from the porch of their two-story cabin and they had the quiet woods virtually to themselves except for a mostly vacant rental home on the opposite side of the heavily wooded clearing. Fallen pine boughs and dead leaves littered the grounds, and a twin set of mailboxes, one unused and rusted shut, marked the road that led into town. She had grown fond of it over the years. Besides, you could do anything you wanted out in the country. And yet her mother still worried, constantly worried, about every little thing, it was why they were out here in the middle of nowhere. Don't stay out too late. Don't go into the woods alone. Don't wear short skirts. Don't talk to strangers. She would say. What could happen out in the middle of the woods? There weren't any bears in this part of the country, and they didn't have anybody living around them. Their closest neighbor was several miles up the narrow dirt road leading into town. The only company they ever had was when a family would occasionally occupy the rental home next to them and they had never had any trouble with them. They were the only people Trish had ever actually talked to in this town. God, I'm wasting my life in Crystal Lake, she thought. She was only 17, but she would be graduating soon. After this summer, she would be in her last year of homeschool. What was she going to do with her life? 
Maybe she could go off to college somewhere or get a job in another town and rent an apartment for cheap. Maybe get a job as a waitress or a bank teller and save up enough money to take some classes. Maybe something easy like accounting or being a secretary. Then, once she had saved up enough money, she could go to something like nursing school and have a career for herself. She enjoyed the thought of getting to help people, and after all, her mother had worked as a nurse in the city for a short time. She knew one thing for sure. She didn't want to do it in Crystal Lake. It was nice and all, and quiet, sure, but she had to get away. There was nobody she really connected to in this town. All of her friends were back home in the city. At this point, it was more about trying to make a living and getting away from this place and her family, but it seemed so horrible to think about things like that. It was just that her family was just starting to wear her. She saw them every day. All day. She loved them, of course, but my God, 24 hours a day with your family could really start to take a toll on you. You couldn't be cooped up with your family for too long or you start to go crazy. She never talked to anyone else except for them, except maybe the clerk at the grocery store or the hairdresser sometimes, and when a family would rent the house next door, she would almost knock their door down trying to meet them. Maybe she was just getting cabin fever. Maybe she was just lonely. Maybe she just needed a break or a change of scene. She didn't know for sure, but the Crystal Lake scene was getting old. Her dad would have loved it out in the country, she thought as they kept jogging. He would have loved the fresh air and the atmosphere. They separated seven years ago, two years before they left for Crystal Lake. Trish always thought that it hurt her and her younger brother Tommy more than it hurt her mother. Their dad had always been there for them to get them out of any tough situations and taught them how to be adults and how to apply for jobs and how to fix cars and anything else they needed to know how to do. Even though her dad had fallen out of love with her mom, Trish still loved him more than anyone in the world. She had been the apple of her father's eye, and she had known he was seeing someone else before her mom knew. It was so obvious in the way he would stay in his room for hours, or by the telltale forced smiles and kisses, or staying out all night at the office until 3 a.m. in the morning. He had always bought her anything she wanted and let her do anything she wanted, and her mother was always the strict one, always the one to say no. The one thing he wouldn't do for her was give her an explanation. What had happened? She had asked them. Why can't you guys work this out? Her mom had reminded her that you couldn't possibly ask for an explanation of why you didn't love someone. There weren't any words for that, and she had been right. She really didn't see her father that much anymore. Ever since they moved out here, she didn't really see anyone. She mostly spent her days with Tommy or with Mom. Of course, she loved them, but that didn't mean she wanted to always spend every moment with them. Her only saving grace was that she was 17, and that meant she could drive. But they only had one car. Her mother would reluctantly let her drive into town on occasion, but it was always just to the grocery store or the comic book store with Tommy. Still, it did allow her some freedom. But who could she visit? She didn't know anyone in this town, not even any kids from the high school. What was the use of a car without people to go see? She was probably just being dramatic. After all, she had her whole life to escape and see the world. It had only been six years in this town. It wasn't like she'd spent her whole life here, but still something had to give. Trish snapped out of her thoughts and realized that her and her mother had been jogging in silence for the last quarter of a mile. She remembered that her father had called only a few days ago. I talked to Dad, Trish said. How is he? Miss Jarvis asked hesitantly. He asked me to come out and see him. Did he tell you to take a number? Miss Jarvis said. No, but he asked about you. Did he? Well, on second thought, um, maybe we should go out and see him. Miss Jarvis said. I bet he could stand a visit. What do you think? Trish grinned slyly. I think you're just getting horny. Miss Jarvis blushed and rolled her eyes, and they went back to jogging in silence. Come on, Mom, Trish thought. It was a joke. You don't have to get so worked up. She stared out at the shimmering lake as they kept jogging down the trail. As she squinted through the trees, she thought she could see a dark figure in a small stand of trees on the opposite side of the lake. Or maybe not. As she slowed her jogging and squinted harder at the stand of trees in the distance, the figure vanished. God, Trish thought sheepishly. Who would be all the way out here in Crystal Lake? It was probably nothing, or, or a hunter, or just her imagination. Her mother was starting to wear on her, she thought. Pretty soon, she was going to start liking the isolation. But for now, she just wanted to have a little fun and meet someone new. What was so wrong with that? She was actually starting to hallucinate people in the woods. She was becoming her mother. Maybe it was that it was Friday the 13th tomorrow. People always said that bad things happen to you on Friday the 13th. 
But Friday the 13th was just another day out of the year, she thought. Just a silly superstition, right? Trish and Mrs. Jarvis stepped through the door of their wood frame two-story cabin to the sound of mass gunfire and digital explosions. Miss Jarvis's 12-year-old son, Tommy, sat at the computer desk in the living room. A grotesque rubber mask pulled over his face, his fingers moving rapidly across the keyboard as he blasted his way through a row of enemies. Miss Jarvis frowned. She would never understand why kids these days were so enraptured by video games. Tommy would sit at the desk, his eyes glued to the screen, playing computer games for hours on end. How could a computer game be so much fun? All there was to it was to fly around in some sort of craft and blow everything in your path up. It was nothing but mindless violence, but still it kept him occupied. After all, when they moved to the country, Tommy didn't have much to do, especially during the summer. He had begged for a new computer the Christmas before and the Christmas before that, but she didn't have the funds. He also wanted a computer game, something called Zaxxon, and she didn't have the money for that either. He already had a computer up in his room, but he claimed that it was too old and too outdated to play the games that he wanted to play. So on Christmas morning a few months ago, she scraped up enough money and she surprised him with a brand new computer and Zaxxon to go with it. Now, she almost regretted it, considering it was all he ever did besides make those horrid looking masks. Not that he didn't do a good job on them, but they gave her the willies, especially when he'd leave them sitting on her dresser to give her a good scare. Tommy, would you turn it down? She called into the living room. Trish chuckled to herself and walked up the staircase to change out of her sweaty clothes. Tommy turned away from his game of Zaxxon and sighed, looking at her through the eye holes in his mask. But I got 98,000, he protested. Miss Jarvis shivered as she saw the hideous features of the mask on her son's head. It looked like something from that sci-fi movie she had seen when she was a teen. It came from outer space. It was a grayish color and the eyes were huge and oval shaped. It wasn't even a scariest mask. He had over a dozen upstairs, all ones that made her skin crawl. But they looked good, so realistic, she often wondered how he did it. He would sit up in his room with his kit, with the door closed for hours working on them. How many robots is that? She asked, playing along. Thirty-five, Tommy replied, turning back to the screen just in time to watch his player die in a pixelated explosion. You lose, and big flashing letters flashed across the screen. Mrs. Jarvis crossed the front hall into the kitchen and reached for a rag on the counter, mopping her sweaty brow. This house was nothing like their apartment back in the city, she thought. Their apartment was squeezed into the back corner of a huge apartment complex, and from the inside you would have thought they lived in a normal one-story house in the suburbs. It was modern and comfortable. This house looked like a flashback to the early 1900s. It was a log cabin that looked like it was designed by Lincoln himself. All of the walls were made of wooden planks, and the railings that surrounded the front and the back porch were made of sturdy wooden logs. The inside wasn't much different than the outside. The ceiling was high and pointed and long, sturdy wooden beams stretched across from one wall to the other. The walls, too, were made of wood, and the rooms were adorned with Dutch doors and ancient oil paintings and wooden countertops. There were even an antique iron gas furnace in the dining room. Of course, it didn't work anymore. It was just a relic from the past. She didn't mind all of the antique furniture. It made it feel cozier. The inside of their apartment in the city felt like a doctor's office waiting room, but this house felt more like a home. Hey, Tommy, why don't you try killing some robots up in your room? Mrs. Jarvis called into the living room. I can't. I need a bypass patch cord, Tommy said, walking into the kitchen and peeling the mask off his face. The mask came off to reveal the young, naive face of a preteen boy. His shaggy brown hair was disheveled by the mask, and he reached into his pocket, pulling out a pair of wire-rimmed glasses and putting them on. Tommy sat down on a wooden bar stool as Mrs. Jarvis crossed the kitchen to the sink and began pouring herself a glass of water. Maybe you can get one in town. Church will drive you. Hey, while you're there, please get a haircut. Mrs. Jarvis said. Tommy groaned in response. Ah, oh, Mom, he sighed. Mrs. Jarvis took a sip from the glass of water and looked down at the rubber mask lying on the counter. That's a nice mask. Do I have to get a haircut? Tommy moaned, not even registering the compliment. Mrs. Jarvis laughed and changed the subject. You're getting really terrific in making those things. Thanks, I just customized it, Tommy said, admiring his work. Hey, where's Gordon?
she asked him, looking around for their pet golden retriever. He went out, Tommy replied, not looking up from his mask. Mrs. Jarvis looked into the hall and saw the back door standing wide open. Oh, someone left the door open again. She quickly moved towards it and closed it. We're in the country, Tommy said. Mrs. Jarvis walked back towards the kitchen counter, her eyes wide with uneasiness. What if a psycho walks in? She immediately remembered last night, that news report about all those kids getting killed. She had meant to tell Tommy and Trish. She had wanted to tell them to be careful for the next few weeks until it all blew over. But she didn't want to frighten them, so she decided to just keep quiet. Just as her mind came back to reality, Trish came strolling into the kitchen, freshly changed into a white blouse and a comfortable-looking pair of shorts. He'd probably challenge him to a game of Zaxxon, Trish joked. She opened the refrigerator and grabbed a pitcher of lemonade and a glass from the cupboard. Hey, Mom, did you hear anything about the place next door? Trish asked, pouring the lemonade into her glass. Uh-huh. It's been rented by some kids, Mrs. Jarvis said, looking out the window at the two-story rental house beside them. Great! Trish exclaimed. How many? Tommy asked. Six. Well, it would be nice to have some company around here, Trish said, sipping her lemonade. Finally, some people her age were renting that house. I could actually make some friends, Trish thought to herself. She had had lots of friends in the city. But now that her mother was homeschooling her out in the middle of nowhere, it was almost impossible to meet anyone. The only kinds of people who ever rented that old house were elderly couples. Maybe she'd meet a friend, or even better, a boy. This might be the escape she needed. None of them had any idea that the company they would soon receive would be more terrifying than any of them could ever imagine. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 2 of Friday the 13th for the final chapter of Fan Novelization by Landon Turner. Really enjoying what you're doing with the story so far, Landon. Uh, it's so awesome that we have a chance to, to narrate a novelization for the fourth movie. It's one of my favorites. It's a lot of people's favorites, so thank you. Everybody, be sure to thank Landon in the comments below for taking the time to write a novelization for uh, one of the movies that we never got an official book for. And uh, if anybody knows of, like, books for part 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever, if they're out there, fan fiction, fan novelizations, whatever, let me know. I'll see about getting permission to narrate them here on the channel. Even fan fiction stories that are original. If you know some good ones out there about Leatherface, Jason, Michael, Chucky, Pinhead, any of them. If it's fan fiction, let me know and I'll look into finding it. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to see what happens next. Uh, I'm, in, I'm enjoying all the little extras we're getting uh, I thought the kill scene at the hospital with the nurse was, was wicked, was wicked. Great job on that. I also want to say a big thank you to my wife for uh, doing the voice of Mrs. Jarvis. Thank you, Beth. Love you. And, uh, yeah. Uh, let me know what you guys thought of tonight's chapter, and I'll be back very soon with more. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>